This show is sponsored by the Cranebrook Restaurant, a piece of Europe in a country setting and a farm-to-table menu, and by Eric Clay, NMLS number 872270, and Embrace Home Loans, NMLS number 2184, Massachusetts Mortgage Lender and Broker License number MC2184, Rhode Island Licensed Mortgage Lender and Broker, and an Equal Housing Lender. Kava, Kava, Kava. We're not going to the Fourth District Court. Are you sure? Well, they didn't catch you yet. They Keep haven't. Right to Route 58 <laughs> North <Torquay. laughs> Oh, look at that! Oh, there oh look, here the we car. go. There's the sun. Kava. Now we're in Kava. We're in Kava. Woohoo! Our first stop in Carver was Dee's Omelets in Carver Square, which we had been told was the place to go for breakfast. So this is Wendy yes. from Dee's Omelets, and she's going to make sure we get really good food today. Yep, we have really I good should... specials. Oh, oh what are okay. your specials? So it's fall, so today we have pumpkin bread French toast, we have apple crisp pancakes. It's oh. homemade apple crisp and bacon right into the pancake. Oh. Corned beef hash and eggs today. Sounds like winners. We try and keep everything locally. We order from Lolly Farms. Um, you know, resource. Yeah. Eggs are bacon. You know, a lot of the things that are on the menu are all locally resourced. Awesome. Great. That's great to know. So one of the things we do here is we hand cut our home fries. They're red list. Um, we cook everything in cast iron pans. Everything's done um, the way my grandmother used to do it. Um, so everything's fresh, locally resourced. Cool. Oh, sounds great. How long has this has Dee's been here? So we've been here over 30 years. Wow. Uh, we are. We were the first um, business in the complex. Wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We actually had to get a special permit um, to serve the workers. Wow. Really? Yeah. What? So you've been doing this like ever since then? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Long time. Up here. Buddy. All right, let's try the cranberry muffin. Cranberry muffin with local cranberries. Mm. Mm. That is awesome. You can taste the cranberry burst in my mouth. And the muffin is so good and so sweet. I love it. Nice. My favorite place now. All right. Mm. Okay, you getting it? Okay. Okay, I got you both. Is that the apple crisp pancake? Mm -hmm. mm. 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 It's just like eating apple crisp, isn't it? It is. Oh my gosh, it is so good. The pancakes are huge. Wait. Mm -hmm. Pumpkin, pumpkin bread, French toast. <laughs> I'm in heaven. Absolute heaven. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> From Carver Square, we drove up to Shirtliff Park to check out the statues and memorials and get a glimpse of the town buildings, including Town Hall and the police station. What a great dance. It's almost like you could have a dance there. Yeah, you could. But the mushroom. I don't. That's a good shot.
We then went to the library to meet up with Amy Shepherdson, who is in charge of the Carver Room. <laughs> so we are here at the Carver Public Library with Amy Shepherdson. What year was Carver founded and what's kind of the broad stroke history? I know it's like famous for cranberries. Well, technically we weren't founded until 1790, but we were part of Plumpton starting in 17... 17, I can't remember when Plumpton was founded, 1709, 1710. And the people in South Carver had to get themselves all the way up to Plumpton when it was meeting days, and it was a long hike. So they petitioned the mm -hmm. state, I guess, and the second separation was in 1732, and they allowed people in Carver to stay in Carver to make decisions regarding the government. Ah, uh, okay. And it wasn't until 1790 that Carver was incorporated as its own town. Okay. Which is interesting because Carver is quite long. Okay. Do you know the population? Uh, we're just under 12,000. It's been, I've been here since 1988 and it's been pretty much the same. Wow, okay. It hasn't really expanded too much. Okay. Like, almost half of our, is it taxable land, is either cranberries or uplands? So the cranberry industry was the big industry in Carver for many years, correct? Yes. yes. And the 50s was the big, that was the big decade. Carver produced more cranberries than anywhere else. Anywhere else in the world, right? I think so, yes. Right. I, there's just so many cranberry growers in this town, and even the larger companies have land here. So I, yeah. I don't see that it, you still hear about it all the time. And okay. Well, what else, what stands out about the history of Carver? Well, Edenville Railroad was, um, LSD Atwood started, he started using tracks and cars to harvest his cranberry box, and eventually oh. he thought it would be nice to allow his family and friends to ride on the tracks, and that grew into Edaville Railroad, which has okay. now become quite a big place to go, very popular. Right. Um, uh, we have King Richard's Fair. You're, you'll be going there. That's a lot right. of fun, too. We have, those are our two big reasons why people would come to Carver. <laughs> right, right, besides um, cranberries. Yes, and I, I actually, more people come in the fall now than they used to. They, um, the Anglies have, they have tour buses coming through all the time. So there's a lot of old churches and a lot of old buildings. I know the Crane Brook is at a very in a very old building, right? It is actually it's not as old as what the whole area they burned the original buildings burned down. So they, it was rebuilt in the 1800s. Mm. Yeah. It's on here. This is the is that supposed to be the Charlotte furnace. Okay. Yeah. Lots and, of churches. And this is the that's the Federal Furnace. F Federal Furnace. Federal Furnace Road that goes into Plymouth. Well, sure. We have a brand new elementary school. I don't know if you saw it. it. Looks like a spaceship set down in Carver, but it's a great, beautiful building. Oh, we'll have to check um, that it's out. It's just north on 58. Excellent. Um, we're going to have a new police station next door, and I'm sure you saw the beautiful fire station across the street. So. Oh, well, yes, yes, definitely. It's lovely. How old is the town hall? Uh, that was renovated when we moved in here in 88, and I believe it was built, I think, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Well, it was supposedly made at the Federal Furnace or the Charlotte Furnace, which became the the Cranbrook Tea Room that was actually rebuilt in the late 1800s, okay. but it's an old building. The ore came out of uh, ponds that were very shallow, Okay. and they dug up the ore. There's some in the case over there. You can see what it looked like, sort of slag, slaggy looking. Well, that's the after effect, but huh. um, yes, they dug that up and they heated it up and turned it into iron. Okay. And there were at least seven different furnaces in Carver through the late 1700s to the early 1900s. Wow. Benjamin Ellis owned those furnaces. He, he leased the Federal Furnace, and they made cannonballs, and one of the cannonballs was sank one of the British ships from the USS Constitution. Wow. So Woohoo! Car one of Carver's claims to fame. Yay! Fame. Nice! You know, wow. These were made here, so wow. it's kind of exciting. So first it was the iron ore making all of these things, and then it turned into cranberries. Well, thank you, Amy, so much for telling us some of the history of Carver. It's a great little town. Well, thank you very much. Here we are going towards Flax Pond Farms. Cool little dirt road. Pond. Oh, this is so pretty. I 
inside his dorm room was trying to hear my friend at home. Not like I don't need jam because I got a new song. Oh, what is it, tea? Yeah, this is cranberry juice. Yeah, it is. I love it. Back to the dot, we're actually the very first people letting back the cranberry juice. Well, you didn't be going along. Okay, we're the first ones in the Ocean Spray Cranberry Bottle. That is awesome. Jamie West explained to us that only 2% of the cranberry growers do a dry pick. She showed us the process. So, what we're doing is dry Great. harvesting. So, originally, um, way back four or five hundred years ago, the Native Americans the first known users of cranberries, they used them as dye, um, we picked them one by one. Well, we moved forward in the mid-1800s to the Rocking Cranberry Group, which I'm sure you just saw inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now we have six of these mechanical harvesters. The mechanical harvester was developed in the 1950s by a Julius Herbert in Washington State. There's actually a museum on these machines out there now, um, which I recently found out prior, he built these machines in that building, the prior to it being a museum. But before that, it was an ocean spray plant. Oh, that was a small really? one. So, um, we built these machines in the 50s. We have six of them. Uh, they have not come up with anything better since then. Not for lack of trying. They tried to build the machine double the size. They yeah. did it out in our code, and our machines outpicked them. So, huh. these are still, and you can see how fast they go. We go a whopping two miles an hour. So, <laughs> as I told you, most of our bogs are over 100 years old. So we have our vines trained to go in one direction. So you'll notice one man okay. happens to be my husband's on the outer edge. And then the next machines, generally if they're working in a row, we have more people out there, um, they'd be staggering behind overlapping. So they go around okay. the bog, scoop up the berries. If we get a little closer to the machine, we can take a walk down here if you don't sure. mind. Well, this, that's part of our winter work. We take these machines apart fix anything that's broken and put them back together. Farmer's uh -huh. work is never done. Yeah. So those black flakes are now coming down. They're picking up that berry in the vine, bringing it up to the back of the machine where they're dropping into these burlap sacks. Once those sacks are full, they simply, simply take it off, leave it on the side of the bog. We have our helicopter pilot, Kenny, comes out, and he simply lifts the berries off the bog, and he loads the back of our flatbed trucks and trailers. Oh, my God. Wow. Now, we've been utilizing the helicopter for about 25 years now. Kenny saves us time, man hours, wear and tear on the bogs. Prior to the helicopter, we'd have to pull the whole crop off because you don't want to bring machinery out there unless you have to. Right. Less wear and tear on the bog, the better. And so, you. And the workers. And the workers, yes. Sure. So they'd have to wheel, they'd bring the crop off, they'd load on the side of the bogs. They still had to load the back of their trucks. The last thing you want to do is have anything happen to your berries right. from the time they're picked exactly. until they go in for delivery of the plant. Right. So now our helicopter can have the day's crop off in less than an hour. Our truck's loaded. All we have to do is strap them down and get them to the plant. And so that's less than an hour. Like I said, it averages depending on the number of lifts. $15, $17 a lift. If you can imagine that, to get almost 1,100 pounds off your cranberry bog without the wear and tear, your trucks are loaded, it's much more cost efficient than having eight sure. or 10 guys out here for an extra four or five hours a day. Sure. And maybe they want to come back the next day because they're not so tired. Right. Now, once our trucks are loaded, we take them to Ocean Sprays World Headquarters on the Middleborough Lakeville line, about okay. eight miles from here. Yeah. They forklift it off and they take a quality sample. We can't have more than 5% bad fruit in that sample, otherwise all of our hard work helicopter of labor has gone out the window huh. and our berries will go down with standard with the other water harvesters. Wow. Um, once we make grade, our berries will go into a dry storage yep. where they'll stay until they're ready to send them through the sorting and screening process and that's determined by your quality. So they'll take that same sample that they took when you first came in and test it every few days. The longer your fruit stays viable, you will get an extra quality incentive. It's literally pennies on the pound, but those pennies can eventually add up. Yeah, sure. Now, Absolutely. once we're completely done harvesting here, the bogs turn a pretty cranberryish color. The leaves go dormant for the winter, and the germinational bud for next spring is still out there. Huh. Well, it's already out there, I should say. So, we put a winter flood on. Yep. So, we cover the vine a few inches with water. We'll put the boards in our flumes and let the Mother Nature do her thing, flood those up. And in February, if we have ice out there, 
We'll utilize that ice to do a horticultural practice called sanding. Just like sanding the roads in the winter, right, we're exactly. saving the wear and tear on the bogs by putting a layer of sand on top of that ice. Okay. And what that does is the sand helps promote new growth. New okay. roots, new shoots, new okay. uprights. Okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> that being said, in the beginning of March, we're going to pull the water off underneath. That ice will eventually melt. The sand will trickle down into the vine. Yeah. And now we're back to our greatest threat. So, our greatest threat is frost. Frost. So, yeah, we yeah. have a crop yeah. weather report in the fall and the spring. You call into the Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association and they will tell you if there's a frost warning or a frost advisory. Yeah. And they will also tell you what the tolerance of your fruit is. Yeah. So huh. right now with our two separate varieties, I believe, Jack told me yesterday, one can tolerate down to 23 degrees, one can tolerate 24. Okay. Huh. As the fruit matures, it can tolerate a lower temperature. A few weeks ago, I would have said 28, 29 degrees. Um, so we have an electronic temperature sensor control called sensor foam. We call him the man in the box. Then Jack will put the tolerance of the fruit in and we have thermometers out in different sections on the property. And the man in the box will call at some hour in the middle of the night. And Jack has to get up and come out and start our five pumps to get that yeah. water flowing. Yeah. And the water will be warmer than the air. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Oh, you're very welcome. He's with vine. Now the machines out there that Jamie showed you prune. So we get a lot of vine mixed in with the berries. Right. Mm -hmm. Now this is only for our use that we sell from here. But the berries would get dropped on. I always wear my gloves because they can be briars, sticks and sure. stuff. And mm -hmm. push those around. The berries drop. The, the paddle wheel fin blows out the debris. Huh. And then they go up. Mm -hmm. And berries would get in the hopper whatever way they could. We think originally this machine was in that part of the building, which is Jack's wood shop right now. We think they had a hole in the ceiling and they hauled the berries up and dropped them. So they get released. There's a little roller here that is like bumpy roller. It helps them along and the bin is slanted. You can only see from here. Okay. It's this high. So it hits here and it has to clear mm -hmm. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the first four, they make it to the belt. Or I didn't trust the box maker to put the bottom on the box because if the bottom came loose, he lost 25 pounds oh, of berries. Sure. So sure. the majority of these boxes in here you'll see upside down. So the cover gets put on, hand clamp, nails and hammer, hammer it, and spins all the way around to do the other side. Today it would be the sack of berries. Years ago, it would have been the cranberry box so okay. that got dumped on here. restaurant. Look at how beautiful this is. Through the gate in the back. Wow. Look at that. We're here with Marie Marcalo, the owner of the Crane Brook Restaurant. And thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you for making me a part of um, your um, adventure on the roof. Oh, happy to. Absolutely. So I'm curious about the history of this building because it's been around a long time. What do you know about the history? Well, I know it's been, I mean, you can feel it. The energy you certainly can feel it when you walk in. There's lots of history. The original building on Little Pond housed the Charlotte Furnace, which processed iron from the bogs in Carver to make things like cannonballs. Supposedly, one of the cannonballs made here helped sink a French ship during the War of 1812. When the factory closed in 1904, it became a cranberry screening house for the Cranebrook Cranberry Company. Then in 1979, the building was purchased by Mary Cunningham for an antique shop. A couple of years later, she added a tea room in order for her customers to enjoy tea and sandwiches while they shopped. This evolved into a full restaurant which became well known for fine dining. 
In 2004, the restaurant changed hands but was only open for about five years. Then the building sat dormant for almost a decade. Maria and her husband Antonio purchased the Cranebrook restaurant in 2018 and spent seven months renovating before reopening in June of 2019. Being from Portugal, Maria and Antonio wanted to bring some European elements into the restaurant. This was quite natural for Antonio, who is a mason. The philosophy behind the menu is fresh, simple ingredients, local whenever possible. For instance, they use blue cheese from the Great Hill Dairy in Marion. The Cranebrook is open seven days a week for dinner with brunch on Sunday. They can also handle special occasions. Well, I know that Roger and I will be back, and you guys have to try. We have to come here, Don, well. yes. Yeah. 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 certainly bring me some of the troubles that we love to see. Definitely. Definitely. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Thank oh, you for being here. Thank you. 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 Very, very nice. Yes. Yes. Really, really nice You're very sweet. Thank you so much. You thank too, you. Well. We had been told that the new fire station in Carver had a beautiful timeline history of the fire department yes, that we should check oh, out. Nice to meet you. Debbie. Debbie, nice to meet you. You too. That's Don behind the camera. Nice husband. Who's, neither one of you are grandmothers, so I mean... Oh, yeah, we are. are. Yeah, you're being nice. You're being nice. <laughs> one of the things the fire chief, Chief Craig Weston, had talked about was a timeline. Uh, he, they had seen one out in a fire department in Great Barrington, Mass, that they liked. Uh, they had some of the firefighters go out there hunting every year. Of course, firefighters never take a vacation. They always go to a fire station. For <laughs> so they looked at one out there and thought they would like to do something like that in the new station. Um, so I don't know. I was kind of hanging around. I don't do much anyway. So I got going through some of the back town reports. And... Um, picking snippets out. So what we ended up doing was going through all of the town reports back to, I don't know, 1906, I believe it was, and um, picking out everything that had to do with the fire department. Okay. And of course, back in the day, they didn't keep a lot of records. Right. Um, yeah. The fire service is basically neighbors helping neighbors, and it is, still is today. Yeah. But back then, they would go put the fire out in the old barn or your garage or whatever, and go back to work. They didn't think about writing a report or you know, doing paperwork. Mm -hmm. so, so ultimately what we did was, did all of this, we had a lot of the pictures, uh, we collected a lot of pictures from fellas, but, but the fire department had a lot of pictures. Um, so we started to put that into a Word document. Uh, okay. And what we all ended up doing, let me just grab something. Okay. And a lot of, this one doesn't have all the pictures, but we had a lot of the pictures also when into that. That's right. Um, so that kind of started, but a lot of stuff we weren't sure about, so we um, handed these out. I gave it the, the first one to the chief, he went through it and looked at it, and then we handed it out to some of the old timers. Uh -huh. And it's amazing how much um, interest that spurred. Um, you know, that wasn't a 1942 truck, that was a 1943 truck. Right, stuff right, like that. Yeah. I remember that, you know that fire yeah. was There you go. This is what they take to the schools to teach the kids fire
Okay, so how's this? Let's sing. Two grannies on the road, on the road, on to Carver will we go, will we go? And we're going to King Richard's Fair, oh yes we are. Can't wait to have a turkey leg later. Woohoo! Woohoo! Donald, are you having fun yet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to watch for part two of our Carver Show as we explore Edaville Railroad and King Richard's Fair.